Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jillian White, Deputy Editor at The Atlantic. Thank you for joining us for this week's edition of The Big Story. In case you haven't joined us before, The Big Story is a digital event series where we go behind the scenes with Atlantic reporters and editors to talk about some of their latest work. This week, I'm really excited. We are going to talk about conspiracy theories. So we recently launched an entire project on conspiracy theories called Shadowland. You can find that on our website, theatlantic.com slash Shadowland. And on the cover of the June Magazine, executive editor Adrian LaFrance writes about QAnon, a nascent group of conspiracy theorists that almost resembles a new religion. Before we dive into this conversation about QAnon, I wanna remind you about a few housekeeping items. Um, so first of all, you can be part of the conversation. You can do that by typing your question into the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen. I see some of you have already made use of that, so please continue to do that throughout the entire session. I will incorporate those through the next 40 or so minutes, but if you can, keep your questions as short and on topic as possible so we can get through as many of them as possible. And be sure to tell us where you are uh, watching from. We'd really love to know where everyone is tuned in from. So now let's bring in Adrienne LaFrance to walk us through her new piece, The Prophecies of Q. Adrienne, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> how are you? I'm good and I'm in Washington, DC. <laughs> Same. <laughs> um, so let's start off with a really easy question, which is who is Q? This is not an easy question, Jillian. It's actually a really hard one. Um, I wanted to find out who Q was. Part of my reporting, my hope was that I might be able to, to find out the identity of Q. Um, I'll start with the basic premise of QAnon. And the idea is that Q is um, a some sort of high-level military intelligence person who posts anonymously on an image board called Akun, started on 4chan, um, and possesses sort of secret intelligence about a group of evildoers who are operating in secret. And um, so there is someone actually in the world or some group of people who are posting as Q. I do not know who Q is. So there are some theories. Do you have any intel? Are there any favorite theories that you have or things that you thought, oh, there's, there's some credence behind that? They're definitely compelling figures. So I would say, you know, I, I did ask the, the administrator of 8 Kuhn, the site where Q posts. Um, I asked directly if he is Q or knows who Q is. He says he doesn't. His dad, who owns the site, has also said he doesn't know. Um, you know, there are, as you say, sort of all manner of theories about who it might be. There's a question about whether some of the sort of Q influencers are in fact Q or know who Q is. Um, there are theories about whether the person who runs the account has changed hands over time. A lot of people believe that. So I, if I had evidence to say who it was, I would have put it in the story and I, I simply don't know for sure. So I think a question that a lot of people have is why was this the right time to take a deep dive into conspiracies more generally? And why did QAnon feel like kind of the the group or the organization or the theory to center this piece around. Right, so we know that this is a sort of golden age for conspiracy theories and conspiracism. I mean, the president of the United States is a conspiracy theorist, which is in itself remarkable. We also, with Shadowland in particular, wanted to look at this in, a, in an overarching way, not just politically focused and really figure out what are the mechanisms for why this moment is seems so prone to conspiracism. And so that gets you into questions of the way that they spread, obviously the internet and, and the social web in particular as um, really speeding up the spread of different conspiracy theories, but also sort of like what's happen happening culturally and getting away from just the political aspect and looking really at like what's, what is so deeply broken in America in particular right now that has led to the rise of conspiracy theories. And then to your question about Q, I mean, there always seemed to me to be something different. And I've written about conspiracy theories for a long time, but but this one was different. And it was evident to me, even before I started reporting, like clearly it's different because it's sort of this participatory conspiracy theory that's unfolding in real time. And so I had this sense of like, well, maybe, maybe it's really popular because people are just kind of engaged in it in sort of like a fan fiction way almost. And, and so one of the things I really wanted to know is like, who's actually believing this versus are most people engaging it with it almost as a game? Um, and then through my reporting, it ended up being actually really surprising to me to find that there were quite a few people who are 
what I sort of refer to as true believers, and that the nature of their belief in Q seemed to go farther than conspiracism into something almost religious in nature. And so that's sort of where my reporting let me, led me that I didn't anticipate going in. I actually want you to dig in a little bit on the religious angle. When I was reading your piece, I found this to be one of the most compelling parts of it and kind of one of the most compelling reasons that QAnon in particular feels different and interesting in this moment. And I thought that when people were talking to you about why they followed QAnon and why they were so interested in this, I think the idea that folks on the outside have is that this is maybe weird. Occasionally there's been violence associated. Obviously you start your piece talking about Pizzagate, um, but people seem to find some level of hope or promise or something in it, which almost also seems at odds with the fascination with the apocalypse, right? So I'm wondering if you can delve a little deeper into this idea of like, what are the religious aspects and how do you think they ended up getting tied back to QAnon and how does that make it special? Great, so I found the same contradiction, like the sense that where a person might just kind of like casually encounter a Q follower online, might be like in an online mob where you see really angry people defending Q or in news stories where you hear about a violent event having taken place and the, the perpetrator maybe having a, like had expressed pro Q sentiment. Um, and so there's that aspect. But then when I talked to individuals about why they were so drawn to Q, I found again and again this sense of like serenity almost and the sense of, as you say, like hope, people saying that Q is giving them hope and that you know, they find community among other Q supporters and that they come together and they're sort of like studying and interpreting um, these Q drops, as they're called, the messages that Q posts to these image boards. Um, and the more I talked to people, the more it became clear that this wasn't just a sort of political, uh, you, you know, it's a, it's a pro-Trump conspiracy theory. So the people who believe in it tend to be supporters of the president. But it wasn't an expression of political beliefs, but more uh, sort of looking for people who shared an existing worldview that Q really neatly um, just sort of made sense to them from the beginning. I heard that again and again too. And so, so yeah, you have people studying sort of a foundational text or interpreting a foundational text in these Q drops. You have people like forging a community around it. And then this really sort of just complete faith in Q is the other thing. Um, you know, I asked everyone I interviewed who I would, I would refer to as a true believer, you know, there are demonstrably false things here, predictions that haven't come true, um, you know, claims that are just on their face absurd, and people are just willing to reject reason and rationality and just say, it doesn't matter, I believe in Q, this is so much bigger. So, so that really led me to this sort of spiritual aspect or spiritual satisfaction that people were finding in, in this conspiracy theory. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, all right, I wanna take a first question from our audience. This is Brad Pearl from Houston. Um, Brad says, isn't the Q phenomenon a very small group? Why does the media give them so much airtime? Hi, Brad. This is so fun. Um, so yeah, it's a really good question and something that I, I really obsessed over because I did worry about, you know, and we talked about this a lot with Shadowland, the larger project we did on conspiracy theories as well. Like, how do we find the line between um, exploring why conspiracism has taken hold, exploring the stakes, which are quite high, um, versus do we risk further spreading them? Do we risk uh, making them seem too entertaining? And so these were things that we talked about a lot and in my approach to the story too, I mean, first of all, I'll say that it's not just a small group and it's not just a fringe group. It is very much in the mainstream. So there are huge audiences of people going to YouTube and Facebook and, you know, it's no longer just on a subreddit even, although Reddit is mainstream enough um, and Reddit has since banned many prominent Q groups. Uh, but, but my thought going in is that this is in fact consequential and as journalists, it's our obligation to not turn away from things just because they're absurd or dangerous. I mean, one of the comparisons I make in my story is to birtherism. And I was living in Honolulu during the, the rise of birtherism. And at the time, I remember our newsroom really debated, like, should we even pay attention to this? It's so patently absurd. It's so evident what then, you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump, who was only flirting with a 2012 presidential campaign, it was so clear what he was trying to do. 
And yet I look back on that now and think that a lot of reporters didn't take it seriously enough. And so um, hopefully that helps explain a little bit of my thinking. But yeah, it's, it isn't just a small group. So that's, that's how I thought about it. Um, so another question from Susanna Sturgis. Wondering if literalist religious beliefs make people more vulnerable to conspiracy theories or maybe less vulnerable because they've already got an unprovable theory. And I'm sorry, I missed the first part of it. Uh, what, what is it that could? Wondering if literalist religious beliefs make people more susceptible to believing in conspiracy theories. That's such a good question. I don't know if, I certainly have not in my reporting encountered research that finds a strong correlation between if you're already quite religious, then you're also more likely to believe in conspiracy theory. Um, I do, like, I did talk to several people who study conspiracy theories who talk about sort of this spectrum of rationalism to conspiracism. Um, and for Q specifically, there is definitely a lot of borrowing of evangelical Christian language and ideas. Jillian referenced a minute ago the um, sort of apocalyptic worldview and this preoccupation with the end times. And that's definitely part of um, evangelical, some evangelical sex as well as Q. So, so there's certainly overlap, but I, I don't, this, to the specific question you asked, I don't know for sure whether there's a, a correlation there. So I have a question about, you wrote in your piece that this really started gaining steam around 2017. So that was right after the election. Um, and there are obviously some level of correlation, if not causation, with Trump and kind of people who voted for Trump um, or who believe in his ideal ideology. But looking forward, I'm wondering about two things. One, um, how you think QAnon and true believers dovetail with and will interact with this time of the coronavirus pandemic. And then a little bit stealing Will Jones from Cheverly, Maryland's question. Um, how will conspiracy theories affect the 2020 election? Such good question. So the Q crowd is all over coronavirus conspiracies already. Um, it's, it was actually really interesting to see this play out right around the time I was finishing writing this story uh, was when we were entering like official global pandemic status. And so I noticed it seemed that the, the Q crowd was sort of taking Trump's or following Donald Trump's lead on this. So at the time when he was saying like, this isn't a big deal, it's nothing to worry about, Q wasn't really weighing in on it. And then as that changed is when you really started seeing the, the sort of rise of pandemic conspiracy theories. Um, one of the examples I give in my story is there was a, a, a widely shared Facebook post that was sort of remixed and shared across the web where people were debating the, the sort of Q groups were saying that, oh, Donald Trump was wearing a yellow tie. That's proof that coronavirus isn't real. Based on like the maritime flag, when it's yellow, it means it's yeah. all So just like wild contortions of trying to, to say that coronavirus was fake. There's also a whole contingency that will say that, um, that coronavirus was unleashed by the quote unquote deep state um, working with China. So, that, so, you know, within the realm of QAnon, there are like endless other infinite rabbit holes and sub theories and coronavirus has played prominently into those already. Um, yeah. On the question of the election, uh, I think, I mean, certainly conspiracy theories will play a role in the election in so far as Donald Trump promotes them frequently. And so that I can only imagine that will continue, um, especially this week has been quite um, quite a week for conspiracies in the Oval Office. Um, and then just misinformation and disinformation more broadly. I think uh, people have asked me before whether there's any evidence that like Russia is behind QAnon, for example, and I didn't find that in my reporting, but I am certain that Russia plays close attention to the conspiracy theories that have sort of seized the American imagination and would absolutely leverage those to continue to sow political chaos and discord here. So uh, without knowing who's behind them or driving them, we know that foreign actors are interested in exploiting existing conspiracy theories here. So um, that's the, those are the first things that come to mind. So that actually dovetails nicely with a question that I know a bunch of our viewers had, which was how much of a global phenomenon is this, or is it mostly US centric? Someone actually had a question about Russia. Sorry, I'm missing your name at the moment. And then Karam in London um, said that reading this piece alongside uh, Franklin's piece in the magazine made them wonder whether or not the IRA could be fanning the flames as well. 
Yeah, so I really, I, in my reporting, I really didn't focus on foreign actors. And I think there is a ton to look at there. Like we have, again, just looking at what happened in 2016, we know that people, you know, Russians and beyond look to exploit this kind of, of chaos in America. So uh, I, I just didn't look into it for this piece, but you're right, everyone should read Frank's piece too, which is, which is brilliant and terrifying. Um, and uh, what was the other part? You had a first part of your question that I've totally missed, Jillian, sorry. Oh, no, so it was basically just what is the nature of this globally, or is this mainly just a US okay. phenomenon? Right, so it's not just a US phenomenon. I mean, Q specifically is, is global for sure, despite being focused on Trump, who's American, of course. Um, but conspiracism generally is a global phenomenon. One interesting thing I learned in my reporting that I didn't write about in the, in the story was just that it's not as though you see certain regions being more prone to conspiracism per se. I mean, in some cases, in some political moments, like you see a rise of populism correlates with the rise of conspiracism, which is really interesting, or, or moments where there is a great display of wealth disparity also correlated with a rise in conspiracism. Um, but more that if you look around the world, the nature of conspiracy theories and what people believe is different. So one example that one uh, one researcher gave me is that if you ask people about the moon landing in America, it's a relatively low population of people who believe the moon landing was faked. Whereas if you go to France, he found in his research that the French were much more willing to say like, oh no, the Americans never made it to the moon. And that's more <laughs> new politics than, um, it's, a, it's more about who is cast as sort of the hero um, or not. So th that's one interesting example that I found. Yeah. We have a few people who have asked questions that basically amount to, if I have a loved one um, who believes in Q, for instance, uh, Cheryl from the Chicago area says, my son believes in Q and considers himself a patriot. Should I be concerned? There are a few others who say if they have, and you mentioned a few of these folks in your piece, if I have, for instance, a mother or an aunt or an older family member who believes in Q, um, how would I even begin talking to them to try and get them to see maybe that there are parts of it that certainly don't make sense. It's a really good and difficult question. So there is a lot of research into this question of how do you convince people to accept reality, which should mm -hmm. be easy, but unfortunately is not. Um, I think if you look at a lot of the research around the anti-vaccine movement, people have found, and we've written about this, I should be like dropping links into the chat. Maybe I can do that. <laughs> in but we've written some interesting stories about how if you just try to go up to someone, and this, and this stands to reason, like if you just go up to someone and you say like, what you believe is nonsense, like just yeah. look at the facts, that often isn't persuasive and in fact just annoys people. Um, but trying to understand why someone believes something you know, presenting them with facts on their own terms, those kinds of things are tactics that you hear about being more likely to work, um, approaching people with empathy rather than aggression. But no, I think it's really challenging. And part of the problem is, you know, with Q, it is concerning. It amounts to a mass rejection of reason. And that's not only damaging on a personal level for someone to sort of have a break with reality, but also um, on a certainly a societal level. And one of the people's questions you mentioned, Jillian, they talked about someone identifying as being pro-Q and a patriot. Yeah. It is really interesting the extent to which the Q crowd has adopted this language of patriotism and, and talks about their sort of mission as being ultimately patriotic, uh, a battle between good and evil. So, you know, it, it just saying you're a patriot may be fine, but then when it's wrapped up into all of this, um, you know, fantasy treated as real, that's when it's really concerning, I think. Yeah, um, I'm trying to find the person who asked this, but someone asked a question that I've actually had too, which is why the focus on pedophilia specifically? Is it just because it is so universally abhorrent and everyone can kind of get behind the idea that that is bad and as you just mentioned, um, just morally corrupt or is there something else there? I think this goes to the whole notion of a battle between good and evil. So, I mean, there's a couple, it's really interesting. I think you're right that everyone can agree that the notion of child abuse and specifically child sex abuse is, is awful. And so you'll hear a lot of people say, and, and to be clear for those who might not be as steeped in Q as I am, the, the basic premise is this idea that powerful, global, globally connected elites are secretly abusing um, children and deriving power from it in some way. And so um, 
a lot of people will say, you know, if there's even a remote chance that one child is getting harmed, why wouldn't you consider that this could be real? Which is understandable and persuasive, but there are no facts to support any of it. And so my thought there is why wouldn't people focus on the child abuse that is actually taking place and, and how they can support solving the, the actual problem that exists. Um, so I think it's that. And then I also think, you know, in talking to some people from my story, there was a sense of, you know, Donald Trump does not fit into uh, what a normal sort of Christian model of moral would be. He lies frequently. He has been married multiple times. And so what one person suggested to me was that this larger narrative about Trump being a savior in a battle between good and evil where he's saving children makes him a moral figure that is more meaningful and therefore can excuse these other flaws that he demonstrates, you know, these flaws of character that he demonstrates otherwise. So um, I thought that was one interesting view of, of it being a way to excuse Trump for his otherwise many flaws. Yeah. Um, I like this question from Carol Mortar. Um, and I think it comes up for me when I remember some of the folks you talked to who talked about how many hours they spent um, kind of on these threads and following Q-drops. Is there a financial component to QAnon? Is anyone making money or financially supporting them? That's such a good question. This is something that I was really obsessed with in my reporting too. I don't know. I was not able to find anyone who's making like a windfall, but certainly there are people who are positioned to profit. So you see it's like very American, of course. There's like Etsy shops set up to sell like yeah. few jewelry and bumper stickers and those kinds of things. Um, there's also the people who are developing their own mass audiences and they are sort of casting themselves as being Q influencers or people who can help you interpret Q drops. And so th these are people who might, you know, um, make YouTube ad revenue off of their videos or um, otherwise, you know, you see people with, their own websites devoted to Q who then ask for donations to support their work. Mm. So again, I'm not sure it's making people rich, but it's certainly people are looking for ways to make money off of it. Yeah. One of the things I found really interesting as I was reading through your piece is that I think a lot of people, if they haven't really read into QAnon or kind of heard the broad strokes of it on the news or something, assume that it is very much a politically driven, party driven, um, type of conspiracy theory. Um, and as you said, it seems that there's like a correlation, but not necessarily a cause. Um, Scott Baila has the question, he's from West Virginia, is there a liberal equivalent to Q? This is such a good question. I, I looked into this. So, so right, to, to your first point, Jillian, there, you often see Q described as a far-right conspiracy theory. And that's not exactly right, because what it really is, is a pro-Trump conspiracy theory. And Trump is not an ordinary Republican. Um, and so it's not accurate to just say it's a right-leaning conspiracy, although, you know, lots of Trump supporters would identify as Republican, for, potentially. Um, and then in terms of a far left equivalent, I don't know that, I mean, Q scores really high. It's certainly in the right-leaning, but it's not like it's super on the right. If you were to look at, I talked to one researcher who talked about sort of like a matrix of conspiracism where you could look at the dimension of um, high conspiracism to rationality and then left to right ideologically. And you might find like GMO related conspiracy theories more to the left, um, certainly birtherism more, and QAnon more to the right, but Q being higher on conspiracism than it is off to the right, if that makes sense. And yeah. But yeah, I don't know that there's one, I, I'd have to look there isn't one that comes to mind that was extremely far to the left, but there are examples like um, certainly GMOs. And I, I'm trying to think of others. If I can think of them, I will bring them up. <laughs> yeah. No, and if anyone who's watching has not read the full piece yet, I think this is something that's really interestingly addressed in there, especially in some of the people you're able to talk to. People who, for instance, and we know this is already kind of a weird dichotomy of folks who say, I voted for Obama once, twice, and I now strongly believe in QAnon, and also voted for Trump. Um, people who grew up in like very democratic liberal households, um, but are like true believers. Um, so I thought it was really interesting how, as you said, this has been cast as a far right conspiracy theory, but it's actually a little bit something else. It's um, establishment is what it really is. It's like anti-institution, anti-establishment is the defining characteristic. Yeah. 
Marina from LA says, does QAnon promote violence, which I think is an interesting question, or is, I guess my question to tack onto that, sorry for stealing your question, is, is there an active promotion of violence or does like the vigor which, with which Q and QAnon believes in kind of the moral crusade that it's on end up evoking violence? Yeah, this is a really good question. I would argue that Q does promote violence. I mean, it's, there are certainly, and this is a point of contention, I mean, Q followers get frustrated when they're cast this way because a lot of them simply are find, finding spiritual satisfaction from this conspiracy theory. But if you look at the, the Q drops or the posts that, that Q puts up, there are lots of like, you know, they talk about a, a war that's coming and there's lots of like patriots need to fight and the great awakening is coming. I mean, it's very like spinning people up. And I think there, you could argue too that there's plausible deniability that like, just because Q is saying there's a war coming doesn't mean you have to fight in it. But I think any reasonable person looking at these in aggregate would see why it's concerning from an incitement of violence standpoint. Adrian, I want to take like a slight step back just because I feel like I know this from being your colleague and seeing you spend so much time reporting this out. But can you take us through how long you've been reporting? I know you've been re reporting on conspiracies long before you did this piece, but how long did this piece take to report out? Um, and kind of what did you have to put into it? And what was the hardest part of reporting this story? Um, the hardest part was also being executive editor of The Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> so that took, that was hard. No, I think I, I started looking into this. I mean, it's true. I've, I've written about conspiracy theories and misinformation online for a really long time. And around this time last year, so I think May of last year, I had a conversation with our editor in chief who wanted someone to do a, a piece on Q and was sort of like, oh, you should do it. So I started kind of like paying closer attention to Q at that point. I didn't really start reporting until August, probably. Um, and then I was sort of just, I was opportunistic. Like I happened to be in Florida for a journalism conference and decided to go sort of doorstop this sheriff who had been photographed with a Q patch on his, on his tactical vest. And so I took opportunities wherever I was in the world to add reporting. Um, yeah. And then just really immersed myself online in these Q communities. And I think that was the bigger thing for me. There were certainly key interviews I had to do and I did those over time. And I went to a Trump rally, for example, which was a really important part of my reporting. But it was more about just really spending time in the places where Q followers congregate online um, and making sure I had a clear understanding of what it was all about. And so, and then when I was talking to people, I had the, the frame of reference to be able to understand the way that they saw it. Um, so yeah, and then the hardest part for real, probably, was just, there was a sort of mind melting aspect to all of this where I went in wanting to know like, okay, who actually believes this? Like why, how and why would someone actually believe this? And then talking to people and hearing them use some of the language of journalistic values to mm. explain the appeal was really fascinating and contradictory to me. So like, People would say things like, I just want to know the truth. I want to do my own research. I want to think for myself. And clearly they were really sort of invigorated by a sense of having access to insider information. All of these things journalists can relate to. Like, I love knowing secrets, obviously, um, <laughs> and reporting them. Um, I'm very motivated by a search for truth. And so like yeah. hearing people reject reason, reject enlightenment values, but use the language of fact finding was, and not being able to like explaining their way out of any confrontation with the actual truth was just that scrambled my brain multiple times. Yeah. I, how much of it is asking is essentially defending the belief with asking someone to prove a negative. Um, at one point in your story, there is a conspiracy theory that has something to do, I believe with JFK Jr. And you ask the person, what evidence do you have that the conspiracy theory that you believe about this is true and they ask you well what evidence do you have that it's not and i just kept trying to think well no this is a fact <laughs> we we know for sure that this is what happened there is evidence that it happened um but i guess how much of it is just getting caught in that old trick of trying to prove a negative a, a lot a lot a lot of it i mean it's everything honestly and and it, in that moment that you're describing it was waiting in line to get into the trump rally in toledo in january and it was a funny moment because 
that the, the exchange was exactly what described. I was like, well, you have no evidence to support this. And he was like, well, you have no evidence to support that it didn't happen. And I, I, I just started laughing in the moment and he did too. Like, I think he realized it was absurd. And yet that's the level. I mean, same thing when you ask people to explain, the Q believers to explain, you know, um, like this prediction that Q made didn't come true. How do you mm. still believe? And again and again, they would say, well, sometimes the predictions are false on purpose or it didn't come true yet, but it will. And so it's just like endless justification. And yeah, it, it's, a, it's a huge part of that worldview. It, it, possibly it's sort of the fundamental part of it. Yeah. All right. I think let's try and get through a bunch of more audience questions. I'm loving how engaged everyone is here. So I want to try and answer as many of these as possible. Um, Stephen Lucas from Northwest Indiana says, are there parallels between Q following and past cults like Jim Jones or David Karish? It's a great question. I don't know enough about those cults to say definitively. I definitely, I mean, I think the aspect of a, a mass rejection of region of reason rather, like it feels cult-like to me, but I, I would want to ask someone who studied other cults more closely. I really focus more on sort of the, the religious aspect. Yeah. Um, Annette, we do not know where Annette is from. Do you think that there is a possibility of organized violence in not ceding power if the Republican Party loses the election? Is the, net, is the QAnon network strong enough to considerably contribute to such a move? That's a good and scary question. I don't, I don't know. I think the, the possibility of violence tied to Q is real and scary and has been demonstrated. I think the, there is a certainly, because it's a pro-Trump conspiracy theory, there is a sense of kind of, you know, things escalating as we approach the election. I don't know that it's so organized that, you know, we, I thought about this honestly when we published the piece because a lot of people were worried about me getting harassed. Um, my sources who I interviewed were very worried about getting harassed. And I do see it as somewhat different despite, you know, you'll see people online find the hashtag and certainly I had, I've had a very colorful, um, my, my Twitter mentions have been very colorful. <laughs> But it isn't organized in the same way that even like Gamergate was organized, for example. And so I'm not, it, this is one of the interesting things about a, a sort of geographically disparate community forming around Facebook groups. And, and I think if a really charismatic leader from within Q wanted to incite violence, they could, which is scary, but I haven't seen, you know, we haven't seen huge demonstrations of Q people taking to the streets yeah, so I, I would want to be cautious about predicting that, I think. Yeah. Um, Liz from Joshua Tree says, fabulous piece. I agree with Liz. Um, and wonders if there is overlap or kind of similarities between QAnon and what she refers to as kind of far right hippie groups like anti vaxxers. Interesting. Um, thanks, Liz, first of all. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure. Anti-vaxxers also, I think, I sort of identify them with being left in some fashion too. So we have, we should look at, at what the ideological makeup of the anti-vax movement is. Um, but, but yeah, absolutely. I think you find common sets of beliefs overlapping between different conspiracy theories. So definitely there's been this weird Venn diagram overlap of anti-vaxxers and Q people because of the pandemic. So you have the same group of people saying that the pandemic the same group of people who believe in Q, who say the pandemic was unleashed on the world deliberately, and then who also say, and therefore you shouldn't get a vaccine when it becomes available. So like there, is, there are these weird sort of coalitions between different conspiracy theories. Um, but I think if you were to reduce them down to the core worldview, it would be in the case of like the Q believers who are also anti-vaxxers, a lack of faith in institutions, um, anti-establishment beliefs, those kinds of things. Whereas if you looked at other overlapping conspiracy theories, you might be able to sort of reduce it down to some other core set of worldview. Yeah. A kind of consistent question that we are getting is folks wanting to know what the response to your article was from um, Q believers or the Q community. It's hard for me to know because I'm not, the, the Q community is so disaggregated. So there are like multiple huge Facebook groups. And obviously I can see my own Twitter mentions, but that's a very small population of people. 
Um, I don't know that Q, him or herself, has read it, so I'm not sure about that. Um, but in terms of just what I've seen directly, I mean, I've gotten a lot of, it's a lot of just like Q hashtags and catchphrases, and it has been actually less vitriolic than I expected. I've gotten some mean emails, but other than <laughs> that, it's mostly just people sort of underscoring their belief in Q and saying sort of like, wait and see, you have no idea. There's a lot of like anti-journalist sentiment sprinkled throughout. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. amazing. Um, Clint Wilder asks, since there's a preoccupation with pedophilia, where does Jeffrey Epstein fit into Q theories and is that mentioned much? It is mentioned and it's one of the, it's one of the examples that people use to say, well, this turned out to be real. Why shouldn't any other horrible thing turn out to be real? And so you definitely you see people mentioning Epstein and doubting the circumstances of his death and sort of leading down, you know, there's a whole sort of subset of people interested in Epstein who are Q believers. Um, but I think, I mean, not even like looking beyond just Q, that's a huge part of conspiracism more broadly is this sort of tantalizing question of like, okay, but what if it's real? Some, some conspiracy theories turn out to be true. And so I think that's one of the, the things people say to defend their beliefs too. Um, so I have a final question for you, which is that as it seems like we're in this really odd moment, this really fraught moment, what is your prediction? And I know we hate to ask fellow journalists to predict things, but what is your prediction or your analysis of how conversations around Q and within the Q community will change or grow um, as we get through this pandemic and certainly as we go into the election? I mean, my sense, I, this is the argument I make in the piece, my sense is Q is not going anywhere. So Q, the entire theory is a remix of Pizzagate. It has shades of end times obsession that go back to the 19th century, go back to the Crusades, honestly. Like you can go way back in history and find the, this flavored conspiracy throughout, which is fairly wild and um, disheartening. And so I think there's a possibility that that Q could change or Q could stop posting or the person who has been behind the account could reveal themselves. But I, I ask people this time and time again, like, what if you find if Q reveals himself tomorrow and says, this is all hope, sorry. Mm. And people would say over and over again, it doesn't matter. This is so much bigger than Q. It, it's irrelevant almost. And this is why people seem to not care. The true believers seem to not really care about Q's identity, which also surprised me. So I think we're stuck with Q for a while. Certainly we're stuck with this worldview for a while. And, and whether or not Trump is reelected, that pushes this Q narrative forward in different ways, but still is, I think, going to be animating. And so my prediction is that Q is here for at least a, a long time ahead. Well, I know we could talk about this all day. Um, we're gonna leave it there. Adrian, thank you so much for this conversation and for your incredible piece. And thanks for, to everyone for watching. Um, we hope you'll visit theatlantic.com and subscribe to our journalism. If you love Adrian's incredible piece and this conversation, subscribing is absolutely the best way to support and keep those things going. We hope you'll join us for the next big story next Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. That will be a conversation between the Atlantic's Frank Foer and McKay Coppins about Russian interference and our election. We'll send you more details via email, so stay tuned for that and see you there.